Okay. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, thank you for joining the first physics colloquium of the year. Um, today we have the pleasure of uh, hearing from Dr. Evgeny Grishin. Um, Dr. Evgeny uh, PhD at Technion in Israel in 2020, and he was supposed to uh, join us at Monash straight afterwards, but due to some unfortunate circumstances, it had to be delayed. Uh, but fortunately, he was able to come into the country uh, around June last year, and ever since he's been working with us as a postdoc. Um, but he obviously didn't have too much chances to meet everyone of you here. So uh, I think today we have a great opportunity to uh, get to know him and get to know about his great work that he's been doing in, um, and he's working on. So uh, Kenny, uh, please take it away. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, can you see my slides? Just yeah. do a full screen. Okay, you see the full screen? Yeah. Right, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to give this colloquium. So first of all, I have to apologize because I'm still kind of recovering from COVID. So I still have some cough, which doesn't seem to go away. So I'm sorry if I'll have some interruptions in the speech. Actually, although it's a, it's an, uh, it's a Zoom club, you know, unfortunately, I was hoping for it to be in person, but seeing at least the participant list, I, I, I actually am excited as if it was an in-person one. So it's actually quite nice to, to feel excited again about giving talks. Right, so I'm gonna be speaking mainly <coughs> about uh, uh, works that I've been doing mostly throughout my, my PhD and some also recent uh, follow-ups that, that, that we have recently completed. And it kind of relates vaguely to, to, to the idea of what can happen in white binaries and how they, how, they can, how, how they can collide with wide applications from source system dynamics to galactic dynamics and gravitational waves and uh, all of this stuff. And uh, there's a long list of collaborators of, of various countries some of them are actually going to be our next special seminar speakers in, in the current month or two, so uh, stay tuned. So um, I'll begin. So we know that um, a lot of the systems we see in nature are, are multiple. Mainly it means that we have three or, or more objects. For example, most of the massive stars are in multiple systems. Also, we also at least in dynamical formation channels, we know that the black hole, black hole mergers are usually could be dominated by many body interactions that bring them together. And if we go to solar system scales, actually, and planetary uh, scales, a lot of the planets are in binary star systems. And if we even zoom in into our own solar system, especially to the Kuiper belt, th there's a large binary fraction for Kuiper belt, for, for Kuiper belt binaries. Um, and we want to kind of explore, explore how these things form and, and evolve and etc. <clears throat> Namely, we're interested in, in highly eccentric binaries, uh, how they get there, how they evolve later. And they're interesting mainly because if a binary is really eccentric, it means that it had some interesting dynamical history. It's, it could be relevant for the formation of high Jupiters, for galactic center dynamics, for uh, anything you want. And um, because essentially it's just two body or three body, or three body, it's kind of scale free. You can apply it, as I said, to solar system, to various objects in there and to other scales as well. And uh, yeah, so before we move on to the details, I would kind of want to give you the, the punchline of the talk. Basically, the punchline is that if, if, if we have wide binaries, by wide, I kind of mean that as wide as you can get them before they, they're torn apart, they can actually, it's a bit counterintuitive, but, but they can get actually really eccentric and collide more easily. And uh, there are like various examples that we're going to walk through in this talk. Um, so we can think of triple systems with extreme mass ratios. For example, if you have some binary minor planets plus the sun, it is a triple system. And obviously the mass of the sun is much larger than the mass of the other bodies. So we can look how it evolves. So I'm gonna spend the bulk of the talk kind of discussing uh, these dynamics. We can also think kind of the same scaled up problem, basically having binary uh, stellar mass black holes orange stars circling some supermassive black hole in galactic nucleus. It's kind of the same, the same idea, physics is a bit different, but again, we have like really extreme mass ratio. And yeah, and, and other people also have worked on, on how Jupiters, how they form. So, so that's gonna be in triples with uh, extreme mass ratios. In addition, we can also think of, uh, okay, what if we can have com comparable masses and we just add extra forces? So we can add gas, for example, in the AGN disks. 
or we can have some uh, quadruple systems that I'm not going to discuss here, but it also creates interesting dynamics. And I'm going to focus more about ultra wide uh, stars, mainly in the in the field. So people have been working on, on wide field binaries and how they evolve, how the revolution could be collisional. And I'm going to focus on recent work that have been recently completed about triples in lactic tide, but that, that will be at the end if I have time. So this is kind of the punchline. Again, if we have wide binaries, they, they are prone to, to collide. And we're going to unfold in this talk and see how it actually occurs. Right, so, so by, by the binaries, well, in, in order for them to collide, they need to become eccentric. And uh, the, the way to, the, there are kind of two main ways to get eccentric binaries, either from integrable dynamics or from chaotic dynamics. By integrable, I mean, uh, basically, you can, you can think of three bodies, you can do a series of, of sacrifices and approximations, which we're going to discuss soon. <coughs> So, so that um, will have an integrable problem at the end, and we can kind of uh, dwell on that a bit. But it will have some limit, to, and that could actually kick in, predict that evolution could be eccentric. But it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, yeah, it's it's, it's uh, it has some limit to the range. Well, actually, we will add we want to add some chaos into the system, and um, the way to do it is to do it is either to break down some of the approximations that we've made and see how chaos emerges uh, in that case. Or we just add some additional forces that could induce extra perturbing uh, frequencies in the system, and eventually we'll end up with, with something that's called as resonance overlap, which we're going to discuss later. And that could be applied to basically wide binary origins of stuff. <coughs> so here's just a variety of papers that, that, that we had recently, uh, yeah, towards the end of my PhD, namely of this uh, formation for the set 2014 MU69 object. So yeah, let's, let's just discuss about that. What actually is this object? What's this Arokov thing? So basically, it's it's a contact binary in the Kuiper belt. So the Kuiper belt is basically a torus of debris, which is located here beyond the orbit the orbits of Neptune. <coughs> and um, this was a picture taken, I think, by the New Horizons telescope that uh, flew past Pluto and then found a target. And basically, it looks like you have two lobes that have merged uh, together. And the question is, how, how did they, uh, they come to merge? And what are the properties? How can we uh, explain that? So um, the thing to remember is, is that it, it's a very weird system. So uh, first of all, it has to collide with a small, velo with a small velocity because they're very fragile. They're like 10 kilometers uh, of, of length. So if you, if you kind of try to collide it with, with high velocity, you're going to get fragmentation. The other thing is that you have a very slow rotation period, much slower than expected if you compare it to other uh, quantum binaries, at least in, in other areas. So yeah, so it's so we can think maybe you can kind of start spiraling in things together, but then you would expect that the spin will be much faster. And the mostly weird thing is that actually it has quite large obliquity. So here I try to to plot kind of the uh, the, the orbit around the sun versus the, the spin axis. So it kind of uh, stands on its side and rotates, which is which is a bit weird. <laughs> so we're kind of left with only highly inclined gentle collision that, that, can, that can form this binary. And uh, yeah, so let's try to think, okay, maybe we can think of the third body as being the sun that can perturb an initially wide binary and see what happens. But in order to do that, we kind of need to go to the textbooks of free body dynamics. Maybe we, start, maybe we should start with two. So for two body, you know, it's kind of known for like a lot of time for like 300 years or more or so. That's it. It's integrable. You have all these Keplerian, uh, <coughs> Keplerian ellipses. You have the six degree of freedom, the angles, and, 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 and whatever. That's nice. If we try to add a, a third body, we kind of known since the late 19th century that it's not going to be integrable. It's going to be inherently chaotic. So maybe all hope is lost. But I mean, we can restrain ourselves to kind of a uh, kind of a uh, kind of a uh, some we can restrain ourselves to some approximation that we can make. So we can use some perturbative techniques to maybe have a hope of some solution under, under certain approximations. And one case is, is called, is, is known as, her, as hierarchical systems, mainly that <coughs> we can think of, of an inner binary with some separation A in, which is perturbed by some very distant uh, companion with some separation A out, which is much larger. And in, the, in, this context, in this context, we can think of uh, what's known as a double averaging approximation. Mainly it means, you know, 
we have this inner binary here, we just averaged over the inner orbit. So we have like a, an interacting mass wire or like a ring. We can do the same averaging for the outer orbit again, and we're left with kind of a, hopefully a more simpler problem. <coughs> One way to do it, sorry for the slide, it's a bit technical. You kind of have to start uh, from scratch. You have to write down the Hamiltonian of, of, of the three bodies. Basically you have two constants here and all the magic will occur in, in this red term known as the, the interaction term. That kind of writes down the you know the, the potential energy and the kinetic energies of the system. We can then do some uh, truncation at the quadrupole approximations because it is hierarchical. So we can kind of expand this thing into multiples and stop at quadrupole order. <coughs> we can also do this averaging, namely integrating over the inner and the outer orbit. So we lose any any resemblance of of mean, mean motion or the resonance. We're only left with kind of a <coughs> these. Uh, these orbital elements, and we're kind of looking on the long on the long term secular uh, evolution. And one last thing we do is is we transform this thing into a canonical set of action angle variables known as the the Luni variable. Basically, it means that uh, in in this representation where, where we have these six um, variables, it's basically uh, the equation of motion like canonical, and that we yeah, and uh, it's actually more useful to solve these equations in this form because Actually, if you notice here, this function here, it doesn't include the argument. Uh, it, has, it, it doesn't have the line of nodes. It doesn't have the big omega. And, and therefore, it means that, the, that this H1 thing, it's actually conserved. And that's actually, a, we actually were able under this approximation to find a constant of motion, which is nice, which sometimes people um, call it um, JZ. And it, that's a combination of the mutual inclination i and the inner electricity of the inner binary. So that's constant. And uh, in the 60s, both independently, Lidov and Kozai have shown that uh, <clears throat> if you start from a highly inclined uh, um, initial condition, it has to be like know, above this value, which is around 40 degrees. So here we have some example of some system that starts at 75 degrees inclination. It kind of goes this, it kind of goes this coherent uh, oscillations in the in the inclination and the electricity. So yeah, and it, it occurs every typical time scale, which is the secular time scale. It's basically scales as uh, the outer orbit squared over the inner one. And it kind of have these coherent oscillations. And you can actually see that electricity could be actually quite large in this case. And also it could it also attains this maximal value that can be easily derived. So okay, that's nice. We, we have a mechanism that's allows circular binaries to be eccentric, and it seems to be nice and integrable. Uh, let's try to apply it to, to, to our problem. So what's next? So next question is that how far we can put our initial uh, bodies so that actually there will be a binary? What's the natural limit you, you can do it? And in this case, because we have this um, uh, extreme mass ratios, so this mu thing is basically the mass ratio is, is quite small, that's that's called the Hill approximation. Mainly it means that this Hill radius, which is basically the outer separation times this mass ratio to some to the power of uh, one third. It is a natural scale of how far you can put um, binary before it is torn apart. So as a, as a, as a typical scale, we, we can think of the, <coughs> of the earth moon system. So yes, so the, so the moon is, is not, is like 400,000 kilometers apart from earth. It is much closer than the sun, obviously. But if you think of the mass ratios between the Earth and the sun, we can rescale it into, into the Hill radius. And actually, it is going. So actually, the moon is actually a quarter of the Hill radius from us, which is actually not that negligible. It's if you take the moon and uh, take it away uh, twice the size at, at half of the Hill radius, it's going to be unstable, and we won't have the moon anymore to protect us from whatever. Um, yeah, and we, we can also look on uh, satellites in general in the solar system. So each color here <coughs> represents different giant planets. And this is a normalized separation to the Hill radius versus the inclination we have. And we see that actually, yes, so satellites kind of extend until maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.45 of the Hill radius, but then there's nothing. Uh, so it, it is really a measure of, of, the, of how close you can be and still be bound to the planets and not be shifted apart uh, by the sun. And there's some asymmetry here as well between the prograde and the retrograde ones. We're going to touch on this later, but yeah, that's that's our hill. Now, radius that that's the outer extent when we can put a binary before it is sheared apart. 
What about the inner one? So the, there's there's some issues here as well. So if, if we try to put orbits too close, we're gonna feel more the non-spherical uh, quadrupole perturbation of the, of the inner binaries. And that usually causes a psilocyte advance. People usually, uh, everybody know, just say it's, it's a psilocyte procession, but Rosemary always shouts at them and fixes them and corrects them. So therefore, uh, I'm putting a cross line here and I will try to call it a psilocyte advance. But I guess at some point, both my, both my tongue and my slides will betray me. So whenever I say a psilocyte procession, I actually mean a psilocyte advance. And uh, yeah, in this case, at least it, it, it is uh, it has come from the inner quadrupole basically because the, the lobes are really non-spherical. There's a difference between the moments of inertia and it, it is parameterized by this uh, J2 number. For the earth, it's actually quite small, but actually for, uh, for MU69, because they're so elongated, it's actually quite a large number, like 0.1, 0.2, depends on the lobes. And that can cause this upsidal uh, advance. Uh, in the orbit, while while the while the scalar magnitude of the electricity, electricity is constant, so it is important because if you kind of change this angle, you can't really excite the other secular quasi-like oscillations. So what I'm trying to say, at least here, at the in the inner, inner limit, if I'm going to put my my binary too close, it's it, nothing will happen basically, um, it, and it's kind of parameterized in this value, which is in, in this value of this length scale, which is which is. Uh, called the Laplace radius, at least for our set of parameters, it's roughly a few percent of the radius. Many it means if I'll, if I'll try to put uh, a binary inward to this value, basically if A in over RL is a smaller number than one, then this dimensionless epsilon is going to be, uh, is going to be large. And actually we cannot excite electricity that much. Uh, it has been shown a few years ago. So yes, for zero, we're kind of getting the, this is like, again, maximum electricity versus inclination, initial one. So if, if we have no rotation, if this is zero, it's the solid line, it's the, it's the same as previously. That's just the formula for the Emax at 90 degrees, it gets to one. And you know, eventually if, if, the, if this thing is getting larger, the maximum shift is getting, is getting smaller until eventually it's going to be quite negligible and <clears throat> nothing will happen and the binary will evolve in isolation. Um, yeah. Right, and eventually we want to have collision. Obviously, if if we, we can raise our, our electricity above some threshold, which basically one minus the initial radius over the initial separation, that's the kind of the parameter we need to to get there for, for a collision to, to occur. Right. So well, so just to, to summarize in a sketch what I've been trying to say here in the last few minutes that <coughs> this is kind of a sketch of the typical separation scale to the hill radius versus the initial cosine of, of the initial inclination with respect to the sun. So if I'm too close, nothing happens, electricity is constant, I can't get any collision. If I'm beyond the Laplace radius, then I can have maybe some <laughs> limited excitation of the electricity, but still I can't get some collision, only if I get far enough <coughs> at some collisional distance, I can actually get some collision. That kind of happens where this Emax is larger than the electricity I need for a, for a collision. <coughs> And it also has to occur for an inclination, which, which for a cosine of an inclination, which is actually small enough. Otherwise, we won't have the excitation, so we won't have any collision. Okay, that, that's nice. Maybe, maybe it works. But the, there's some culprit over here in the secular collision, mainly because uh, if, we, if we go back to this plot again, whenever we have high electricity, we're going to get a low inclination of 40 degrees. So if you want to collide, we're going to collide that inclination of 40 degrees, not 90. So it's not really helping us that much because we need this high obliquity. In addition, <coughs> this Emax, this electricity, basically this thing, it evolves slowly because this is a secular time scale. It is much longer than, than individual periods. So we would expect uh, grazing collisions and this will kind of graze the, the orbits maybe, but they won't stick. They'll just uh, maybe induce some spin, but I mean, they won't stick. So we want like, we want, like a closer impact parameter. So we kind of need to uh, do something else. But luckily, uh, all, I've, all I've said about this uh, secular approximation actually breaks down in this case, because we can try to use a secular approximation, which is basically the, this dashed red line in various initial conditions. And we can actually compare it to direct <coughs> and body integration, which is the, the blue line, basically. And it has some wiggles in it. So it kind of follows the secular one. So it is, it is good in, to some extent. 
but at least in, in this area where, where we have this uh, highly eccentric uh, passage, it's actually not working that well. You can see that there's some wiggles in here and also in this quantity, in this JZ, which, which, should, which should be conserved. So it is conserved in the, <coughs> in the second approximation, which is basically a line. It actually has some wiggles in it. In the actual body, it has some fluctuation and it's actually maximal um, during this, uh, this highly eccentric passage. So a lot of work has been devoted, including myself, that kind of trying to understand uh, this wiggle, how far you can get this bump. And the origin of this bump, I mean, here you can see kind of the shorter fluctuations, but also in addition, because of this um, breakdown, you also, have, you also can have a, like a long-term effect and you can actually, and, and that, that long-term long effect could actually, could, could, could actually contribute to, to additional evolution. I'm not gonna go to the details of, of how to actually to derive it because it's long and tedious and technical and et cetera, but it, 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 it sums up that you, can, you just need to add some effective potential uh, into your problem. And it's relative certainty is parameterized by, by this epsilon SA, uh, meaning single averaging. Basically, it's just the ratio of, of some time scales, the outer orbit to the second time scale, or just the ratio of the separations that we have. So at least uh, for the Earth and the Moon system, system it's, it's roughly 0.1. It's, it's roughly 1 over 12, because it, it's kind of the ratio between the periods. And they have some uh, implications for that. So that's for the mean. Uh, <coughs> corrections, equals of fluctuating one, but we'll deal with them later. So what, what that can do is, uh, for example, here is some example of some paper that kind of tests that. So the black uh, lines are just uh, end body, which is kind of this, the simulation or the ex experiment we want to compare to, right? The red ones are just, if you have this double averaging, this initial uh, potential, which is kind of doesn't look that well. <coughs> but if you have this effective uh, term, that I've kind of tried to explain how to derive it, but haven't really done so. It actually follows, my, it actually follows well the, uh, the evolution, which, which is nice. So we can also add this term, which, which is good. And actually one, one implication is that if you add this term, you'll have some asymmetry both in the initial inclination that you need for the resonance for the bit of Kozai oscillations, and also is affecting your uh, maximum electricity. And essentially, it kind of breaks down the symmetry between prograde and retrograde. So you have some breakdown over here. And you kind of see in this picture, this is just a maximum electricity in, in units of separation and inclination. And, and it has this tilt. It's not, it's not straight. It, it's, it's tilted. And it's actually more stable uh, in this area, numerically at least. And maybe you can relate that to the distribution of the satellites, because they, they are actually much more and more further out which are retrograde, so it could be kind of in, in this area. So that's nice, but that's not the point of the talk. Let's go back to the, fluctu to the fluctuations. So they are proportional to this epsilon. Again, I think this is the width, and it doesn't really matter from which value we start. We're gonna have the same, roughly the same width of the fluctuations. And at some point, if we start from 88 degrees as here, for example, <coughs> we actually completely miss out the evolution in this crucial point when, when we're getting highly eccentric, right? So the sector theory predicts inclination goes to 40, but actually it goes to a lot more. And that happens because um, at some point, this, this actual JZ is, is allowed to cross zero and become negative. So when it's negative, the cosine I is negative and inclination is larger. So you, basically it means you have some orbital flip uh, in the orbit. And it also means that the, because JZ passes through, <laughs> through zero, <coughs> essentially it means that the electricity is not constrained anymore, so we can't we can't constrain it. Um, but actually, it's, it's actually a good thing. Uh, I'll show you why in a second. So just to summarize all these technicalities, what I, what I was trying to say is that the way to think, at least from my uh, opinion on free body problem in this case, is basically the behavior is, is determined by, by by two parameters: this J Z, the dimensionless ones, and this epsilon, right? As long as, as the fluctuation is not is not that large. We can kind of treat this as a quasi secular problem, mainly kind of having these things and kind of integrating secular with this approximation, and it's going to be fine. <coughs> it's important to correct the secular approximation because it's not zero. It is yeah, it, ha it is has its, some consequences, but still it, it's it is tractable um, in in a secular time scale, which is good because you can do faster codes that, that, that do it. But at some point, uh, you're getting here whilst if you're getting JZ, which is low enough, 
your fluctuations is, gonna, is going to be uh, much more than your initial value. And therefore it means that the fluctuation in the angular momentum is larger than the initial value. And it's faster than the inner orbit. So you can't really trace your orbit. It's not Keplerian anymore, basically. So you kind of have to do embody. You can't really do anything beyond that. But at least uh, the good thing is that we can actually test that against real embody simulations, which is this uh, blue dots. So the green line here is, uh, is kind of our formula that kind of has this correction of the secular approximation plus the fluctuation term. If that's above one, this is kind of, this is unbound and that's, that's the gray area over here. And we can test it against uh, numerical simulations and we we'll actually find a really amazing result. I could not believe the first time I saw that we have this good correspondence uh, because we try, we integrate with the body and actually it's really on this line. So it's really amazing that it fits that well. I was really surprised uh, to find that. So that's actually nice because now we have some analytical uh, understanding of what is the maximum, what is the maximum electricity of, of these systems. So it, it actually falls on this line quite nicely and move on. So we can kind of add additional section to the to this plot, to the sketch that at some point uh, we'll have a region of the non-secular collision. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's what we're having and it's increasing with inclination. And we can now take this sketch and make it into a real plot. So it kind of looks like that. So that's cosine I, that's uh, the separation. <laughs> and the area of the non-secular uh, evolution is actually much larger. Uh, it's also better because we're not constrained to having certain values of the information. In Tristy, we can pretty much get anywhere. I'll show you soon. So first, if we believe that distributions of initial inclinations and separations are kind of uniform or log uniform, obviously this area has, this is, this is much more probable. This has uh, more area. Well, here it's kind of uh, small, so nothing really happens here. In addition, we can then actually prove, go and run the system and actually see that we actually can get an actual collision. So here, I think each time we have these wiggles, it kind of means that we have some, some cycles going on. And eventually it's kind of at this point, because our JZ is allowed to cross zero, it's not really a constant motion anymore. It has no meaning. So it's kind of become, become stochastic. So eventually at some point it will collide. So at least in this example, it kind of collides uh, in the third cycle over here. I just didn't have enough resolution to see the decline, but it, it does collide, collide at some point over here. And you kind of see that this kind of very non-secular behavior of these wiggles. And uh, we can also try various uh, systems and kind of uh, sample from various initial conditions. <laughs> and pretty much what we get is that both the, the, both the, the impact parameter and the time scale and the final inclination are kind of uh, uniform or uniform in cosine or whatever, and the velocity is almost always very close to the escape velocity that we think collisions would occur. It's, it's actually quite small. It's around uh, four meters per second. And so actually we're not constrained by this uh, impact parameter or the inclination, so we can actually get it. So finally, we can compare it to 3D <coughs> SPH simulations done by our, by our collaborators at this, at this uh, escape velocity. And now we need to, to extend the spins as well. We don't really know about, about the initial rotation of, of the objects. Maybe they don't rotate. Maybe the rotations are aligned or anti-aligned, but in any case, so we can kind of derive from just from conversion of momentum, you know, uh, what could be uh, the slope depending on what's the impact angle, angle on, or what's the impact parameter versus the, what, what is the spin we're gonna get. And the idea here is that, first of all, it's, it is compatible with SPH simulations um, that kind of resolve this, this, the details of this collision. And also, it, I mean, depending on, on the initial alignment or misalignment, there's like a wide range of inclination angles we can actually, sorry, there's a wide uh, array of impact angles that kind of get us to the right spin. So it, it, is, it is possible to get the right spin and the right, and the right obliquity um, using these non-secular uh, oscillations. And so that's, that's one thing. And just, just to mention that uh, we're, we're currently trying to extend the theory for a more general case, namely we're trying to kind of relax this hill approximation. We're trying to think what can happen in comparable masses. So instead of this Jay-Z, <laughs> which is nice, it's not controlled anymore, but uh, yeah, but actually we can, we can actually something other, other thing is conserved. I mean, we can kind of derive from, from conservation of angular momentum instead of Jay-Z. We'll have some different value K that depends on the previous Jay-Z end of this eta which is basically the ratio of the inner to outer angular momentum. 
And we're currently trying to derive general expressions uh, for any values of this eta and, and epsilon. So we're trying to generalize our theory and uh, and it is done by, it is, and Abby, who is our graduate student, is actually doing an amazing job and progressing quite fast. So we're happy. And I mean, it seems to be working because I mean, here we're we kind of have these two sections of various, uh, various initial conditions. And uh, this cut kind of represents uh, the, the actual uh, expression for the maximum electricity and its comparison to end to end body. So it seems to be working quite well. Hopefully, we'll, we'll get the, the paper out. So uh, stay tuned for that. So that was at least in throw system case. And again, the same thing can happen for the pluto Charon binary. We kind of wrote an immediate follow-up paper on that. And uh, yeah, so that was for the solar system. <coughs> now I would like to kind of branch out and go to galactic scales. And uh, in galactic scales, we don't have the sun, but we have the supermassive black hole in the galactic center. And we don't have planets. We have compact objects, for example, like if stars or black holes. But it's kind of the same because the mass ratio is kind of again the same, roughly 10 to the six. And instead of uh, instead of uh, rotation, we have uh, gr upside ants, I should say probably, and it has some known expression. It's basically the ratio over the gravitational radius over the inner separation, and it is also known to to quench some of the some of the Lidov cos isolations. So it's really the same thing. I'm just using different epsilon here. It's it's almost the same plot again, the same story. <coughs> We'll have the, this this uh, dimensionless number, which is basically the, the ratio of some driving frequencies or various time scales. And the more GR is important, the less eccentric you can get because the precession ruins our coherent oscillations. So this is this uh, kind of the same thing. And we here you have a comparison between just Newtonian and relativistic simulation. So there is there, there is there is some cutoff um, over here. <coughs> right. In addition, if if we are getting too close. Also have dissipation, right? Because it could also either be by tides, if we have some um, main sequence stars or whatever, or even white dwarfs or planets. So it kind of tends things to, to be migrant and circularized, and it, it should stop once you're circularized. In addition, you can also have uh, emission of rotational waves, as we all know, and it doesn't stop, right? It kind of goes all the way uh, because it just, yeah, because, because you have a changing mass quadrupole. Right, so uh, let us again think about bin a binary black hole in, in a galactic nucleus. We can think of it as a Hercule triple. It, it is plausible because we know there's a massive uh, compact body uh, inside of this galactic center over here. And we know that there are, there are plenty star of stars and gas orbiting it. And there's, there's roughly a million stars within the central parsec. Uh, so we can just imagine there are like plenty of binary black holes um, orbiting it. So it, it's kind of the same idea again. <coughs> Let's try to see what, what can happen uh, with mergers. Uh, so for mergers, um, usually we can kind of write down the time scale. At least if we take 30 solar mass black holes, for example, at one AU, it's going to be quite long time scale, much longer than the age of the universe. Well, if we add, but if they could be eccentric, it, 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 you, we could have some reduction. Okay, this is nice. Maybe we can actually start from a circular one and get eccentric, for example, by rid of cosine oscillations. And then we kind of can get this modified time scale of the initial circular one times this uh, function of the maximum electricity that actually goes like the smaller power, not, 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 seven, not seven halves, but three. This is because uh, the binary kind of spends only a small fraction of the time in high eccentric orbit. It's not eccentric all the time. It kind of has this epoch, so highly eccentric and less eccentric, right? So that, that should be like expected from what's going on. And uh, okay, that's fine. So we're kind of now realizing that, that, that this Emax is an important uh, parameter we need to estimate properly, right? So we can do it maybe. So we can do the same experiment again. <coughs> we can write some expression for what, what our expectation could be for this Emax, and uh, we can test it against uh, uh, and body simulations that include the uh, Poissonian terms up to 2.5 Poissonian that actually has the dissipation uh, in it. So here I think is the same. I think yeah, the supermassive black hole is like located like I think uh, 10 to the minus two parsecs from the binary, and the binary is a 10 of 30 solar mass. I forgot to mention that. Sorry. And at least if it's if it's wide enough for 10 basically uh, 
I mean, there's almost no GR, there's no effects. It, we're, come, we're, come, we're kind of getting back our Newtonian result, basically. It's really sitting nicely on the line. So maybe it works, we're hopeful. So we're trying to reduce the separation. Once we reduce the separation, the GR term will, will be larger because the binaries are closer, they're, they're more compact, they will have more uh, precession uh, advance, sorry. They'll have more upside advance and they're gonna be more compact. So this epsilon SA is gonna be smaller. So it's gonna be closer to double R unit, right? Wait, see this gray line became, became smaller, but actually <coughs> now it's that that's it for you. So now instead of uh, being uh, on the on the green line, it's actually kind of scattered around, actually even below the green line, which is uh, interesting. So there, there's something obviously something more to it that we're missing in our in our simple theory. And even if we go to one of you, we expect that uh, we will have some some cutoff here, so we won't be able to to go that deep. But actually, if uh, if we just plot the, the experiment, it's actually kind of all over the place. So yeah, so we can't really reproduce this in the, in the general case where we have some Ossetonian GR corrections. But the good thing is that, that is it actually, <coughs> it's almost below the line, below the green line, which is actually means that, that the maximum electricity is actually on average larger than you would expect from the naive theory also here. And you know, if the, if the electricity is larger on average, it means that the mergers actually occur faster. So maybe you can actually uh, get more mergers than, than you would expect because more, system, more systems are more eccentric on average. <coughs> That's like the, what we try to test here um, in this follow-up paper. So uh, here we kind of set up say, kind of uh, same simulations that have, been, that have been done with the secular approximation. Kind of uh, we try we probe various uh, galactic nucleus nuclei with, with various masses. We try to think of either black holes, black neutron stars, neutron stars, neutron stars, or double neutron star mergers with various mass functions and, and radial distributions that 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 kind of probe in the galactic center. So that's kind of how it looks like with some initial various initial conditions. And <clears throat> we wanted to compare the merger rates and other properties. Mm -hmm. To what we had, to what people have had in the in the secular in the secular approach, and actually, you can't see it here, but actually we got uh, roughly between five and ten times more mergers uh, using direct and body instead of the secular approximation. The price we paid is that if we're trying to use direct and body and integrate thousands of systems for for a lot of time, it takes it takes a lot. I think it took us I don't know four or five months on a lot of a lot of uh, CPUs, but eventually we got like a really uh, uh, much more, um, much more measures. You can kind of see the distribution, the community distribution of the time scale. So you don't, it's normal. So you actually, you can't, you actually can't see the number, but you know, you can, if, if, if the size of the step is smaller, it means you have more measures, right? So the air chain has like this, this, the smaller step. So it has the most mergers. That's like the numerical. Once you compare it to the secular code, it actually has less because the step is larger. <coughs> so yeah, so it had more mergers. The measure rates were a bit uncertain because it's kind of depending on the on the assumptions of the star formation and etc. So it's 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 uh, so I don't think it's, it's the dominant channel for mergers in galactic nuclei. But around I think twenty percent of them were actually quite eccentric in the LIGO band. Uh, I think above zero point one electricity it was easy, and also also highly eccentric one as well. Uh, so that was actually quite nice to, to see. So that could uh, probe for future GW people that looking for eccentric mergers. Um, yeah. So that that was happened here in the galactic nucleus. So I think that's number two. It's kind of very similar to what we had. So yeah, but that was like for a, a binary that is perturbed by, by some very distant perturbed that, that has a very large mass. What about other binaries maybe in the field where you don't really feel the more more massive turbos? Maybe you have some uh, maybe you have some triple with comparable mass, right? And then um, what can happen there? So for example, we maybe want to focus maybe on white binaries in the field. So recent surveys by Gaia that people have used with some, with some search techniques, they kind of found a lot of white binaries with Gaia, I think 10 to the five, maybe even more than that. And, and white binaries are interesting. By white, I mean really white, like 10 to the four U in separation. Uh, and, and they've been used in, in various uh, settings to probe Black dynamics, uh, when searching for dark matter, maybe, maybe searching for uh, kind of constraining the metal kicks of white force neutron stars, and also in constraining the time scales for uh, quantum evolution. 
So white binaries are common, that's nice, they're important. <coughs> we also know that uh, significant fractions of, uh, sorry, of solar type stars and lower mass and dwarfs are actually, yeah, actually binaries and multiples. So we do expect that maybe a lot of, white, of the white binaries could be actually part of some, uh, of some hierarchical triples. I hope to convince you that triple dynamics, that, that, that dynamics is fun. This is a bit of those kind of things. <coughs> so now I want to add a galactic tidal field. Namely, I'm trying to say that if I have a very white binary, it, it, actually, it is actually being perturbed by the galactic tidal field. And this idea goes back to the 80s, actually. Uh, but to Heiser and Tremaine in the 80s, basically they looked on, uh, on, uh, on the Oort cloud. So we're going to have this uh, Oort cloud. So I've tried to use a cloud for that. And, uh, if we, and actually it's, yeah, it has been observed that actually a lot of the comets of the sun grazing comets that we see, it is believed that they originate from the Oort cloud. So, uh, so you know, we, you have some junk over here. I can do the 4 u You want to bring it really close to the sun. How do you do it? How do you make it so, so eccentric? So the idea was that you can look on the, um, on the galactic potential, including also the, the disk over here with some typical density in the local solar neighborhood. And you can kind of write down the potential and you're gonna feel uh, a, vert a vertical tide over here. And you can kind of do this averaging and some other tricks. And eventually the eventual equations of motion are going to be almost the same as in the cosine mechanism. It's, it's almost the same dynamics, but a bit different, obviously. So we have that uh, basically. So that's, so that's kind of the origin of this, uh, hopefully, of this uh, highly elongated uh, comets that kind of just caused by the galactic tidal field that, that can make these oscillations. And then we kind of want to add another body, right? <coughs> so we want to add instead of having a sun and a, instead of having a sun and, and, and the comet, which is kind of only one orbit, we may have like a a comet here, and maybe you can also have like a, a smaller uh, orbit over here. Maybe the sun is part of a binary system or whatever, right? And that's kind of qualitatively similar to, to a structure of a, of a hierarchical quadruple system. Usually it's termed as three plus one system, and it means you, you kind of have these nested binaries of A, B, and C. So you have uh, four bodies, therefore, and, and yeah, and the separation here is much smaller than, than the intermediate one. And this is again, much smaller than the outer one. So we're having this uh, hierarchy of separations over here, and uh, and you can kind of quantify. So you have this kind of R naught parameter that kind of measures the ratio of the frequencies, and uh, you can kind of think of the similar idea of this parameter that kind of measures the ratio of the typical secular uh, oscillations of the triple over the galactic idle time scale. And the idea is that. At least it, it goes back to, to Chirikov in the late 70s that um, if you have a system, basically it's kind of a double pendulum idea, right? So if you have like a pendulum and you add one more, well, the length are comparable, well, the length of the pendulums are comparable, you would eventually get chaotic evolution because the frequencies of the oscillations are comparable. So you, yeah, you have like two resonant frequencies and, and once they overlap, you, you don't really know which to follow. So that's in short, this criteria of resonance overlap goes by Chirikov, right? And in, in, in these cases, it's just two secular resonances. In this case, either from uh, a fourth body or the coherent oscillation by the tidal field. And yeah, just to demonstrate at least for four bodies, <coughs> it is kind of known to be chaotic. So here I had some example from some old paper of mine that I have some four bodies. So I, I could have some regular orbit, which, which is this thing. So I, I kind of get nothing. And I can also get a chaotic orbit, which is kind of this thing where the electricity actually could, could be quite large. So we can take that and uh, kind of do the same thing for the galactic tide. So this is kind of the same idea, right? So the, the green, this is time evolution of various uh, parameters. So the green thing is the, is the outer orbit. It kind of has this oscillations every few giga years because that's a typical galactic tidal time scale. Every time the, the outer orbit does that, the inner orbit kind of goes nuts <coughs> and does whatever it wants. At some point, I think at, at like eight or nine giga years, it pretty much goes uh, berserk. It kind of uh, gets really eccentric until eventually it kind of could get really high tristes up, up to the minus four, which is quite quite small. So you can actually bring the two stars really close together. And we can try with and without GR, uh, GR uh, corrections. And actually, if we add GR, it's actually even more eccentric in this case, at least. <coughs> okay, but that was like one system. It doesn't prove anything. 
let's maybe we can try to build some kind of a population synthesis, kind of see what, what happens. So I've, I, I took me almost three years on some time scale. I mean, also secular time scale, I guess, to develop a code that has the secular revolution, plus these corrections I've discussed previously, plus the galactic tides I've just now discussed, plus the initial, plus the corrections from GR, from post-Newtonian and, and bulges, plus dissipation, et cetera. So we're trying to kind of sample various initial conditions of the inner separations and the outer separations with various, you know, kind of the standard assumptions on initial parameters. And we have various stopping conditions. Either nothing happens, which is boring after 10 years, or system becomes dynamically unstable, um, as we all know from the marketing and RC criteria that people use. Or we can have interesting things as well. Either we have a close pair center approach so that the pair center is closer than some order unity fraction times the mutual radius. Or we have like a strong migration. That means we're, we're, we're lost a lot of energy and, and it's, a, it's a kind of a spiraling in migrating uh, binary, right? So these are the in stopping conditions. And there's also the following, <coughs> at least for Loma stars, I think we got like that, uh, um, around 40% got, got unstable, around seven got uh, lower plunging and some lower fraction uh, was in spiraling. And the way to read these things, at least in terms of electricity is uh, basically the blue line kind of indicates the initial conditions of all the systems, while the green one kind of indicates the initial conditions of the system that actually stopped via condition three or four that actually did something interesting that actually experienced a close encounter. And we can also compare it to the final uh, outcomes of that. So we kind of see that, yes, in order to stop and do something, you need a final large extricity, which, which kind of makes sense because you, you have to be close to, to do something, right? So that, that is for the electricity. We can go a bit, uh, I don't want to go into much details because it's long and tedious, but at least <coughs> there's some evidence of critical evolution. If you kind of look on the distribution of this uh, R0 parameter that I remind you kind of reminds that it is actually the ratio between two frequencies and whenever it is close to unity, mainly here, it means that these orbits are, are tend to be more chaotic. So we really see that the, at least the final sample of the orbits that did something were actually quite uh, expected to be chaotic. And we can kind of also see it maybe in the distribution while the color code is the collision time or stopping time uh, in log scale. So we have the small population, basically it's, it's kind of, it kind of, it kind of collides quite fast, but it actually starts with uh, very misaligned orbits, almost 90 degrees. So if it's 90 degrees, you don't really need, need Relative tides, you just have this regular standard lid of quasi oscillation that just collide. But that's a small, but that's a small sample. I mean, the, the, obviously, the larger sample eventually, as this R naught crosses this threshold of 0 0.1, we're kind of getting to open up the, this thing. And uh, basically, you don't really care about the inclination, about initial inclination. You can pretty much collide from any initial inclination, and it takes also longer. Because the typical time scales are of giga year, uh, because of the galactic tide, that's the typical time. So you can you cannot get it uh, get it faster. Uh, so we have this chaotic uh, population, which is actually quite outnumbers the the standard bandit of quasi kind of thing, right? So we can kind of repeat the same experiment again with um, with uh, I'm I'm wrapping up in like two minutes. Uh, so yeah, hopefully I'm I'm on time. Do the same thing again with actually trying to do like maybe massive stars. Uh, by mass, I mean up to up to eight star masses, so I, I can have only white works. I don't want to deal with neutral stars at the moment. So my, my way of star evolution is quite simplistic. Just you know, add some typical time scale of t main sequence, kind of update typical tidal parameters, and eventually for the white works. And it's gonna and actually more systems become unstable, but actually number of plunges was was decreased, and actually a lot of the a lot of a lot of the systems much more actually did did migrate right so if we kind of trying to inspect what's going on we, we can we can start from the initial separation which is this blue line sorry about that and we, so it has like two effects so so some orbits actually expand so it goes here because as evolve they lose mass so they expand so we have this thing on the other hand there's a tail of, of orbit that that you know things that actually go closer they do they do migrate so also have this this migration over here and I have these two competing effects, which could be annoying. Eventually, if we try to ask ourselves, okay, we had some collisions or in spirals, and how is it related to stellar types? So we can kind of uh, have like different free populations. Either you had some encounter with a red giant, um, 
which is kind of on these gray lines. So we have like plenty of systems kind of stopped for giants. So we have like a lot of giant mid sequence uh, encounters, also some giant white dwarfs over here. And most of them actually just mid sequence, mid sequence. And we even actually got like a handful of white dwarf, white dwarf collisions, which is actually quite surprising because you really have to be really close. I mean, your pair center is like <coughs> less than a, a 10% of the cell radius, which is actually quite impressive. So obviously when you kind of have all these various various potential uh, encounters between various stellar types, basically it kind of per, per, per million stars or per million, or per million mass solar masses, you kind of have a lot of these encounters, like a few. So it's actually quite a lot. It's actually, if we compare it to just white binaries from the field, it's actually the overall rates, rates of encounters actually larger by a factor of, uh, of one order of magnitude roughly. And obviously now you have all this collision dynamics in the field that are going on. You can kind of have a lot of transients. You can have like a field blue stacklers blue stacle from uh, main, sequence, uh, main sequence collisions and other transients. <coughs> if you have a giant level, you would have, maybe you expect to have some eccentric on envelope, like initial condition to, to have it. If you have white dwarfs, you can have some things with supernovae, either standard or, or, or peculiar one, or maybe some other things. And uh, yeah, and uh, a lot more. Right. But in any case, just to summarize, <coughs> so I've hopefully I've convinced that the hierarchical free bodies problem is, is really scale free and can, and, can apply, and, can, and can be applied to many scales. And uh, we kind of we can calculate the actual maximum electricity for a system. And actually, it, it's, it actually works well in the engineering case. We can kind of explain the formation and evolution of binary uh, KBOs, uh, how they collide. And we can also kind of extend it to galactic scales for uh, mergers of black holes and neutral stars and et cetera. And we can also think of the galactic field as being now an extremely collision environment where actually a lot of these things could also happen by the galactic tide and obviously it needs much more uh, exploration. Right, I think that's it. Thanks, thanks, thanks for listening. I hope I did not uh, I uh, hope I was on time. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that was a very um, uh, fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any questions? If you do, please um, raise your hand or write in the chat box or just unmute yourself. Yeah, I can't see the chat box, so you'll have to read it out for me. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, while we're waiting for questions, um, well, I had one for uh, one of the plots you had where you showed the blue dots were like below your green. Um, oh, you mean, um, I think that one? Yeah, these ones, yeah. So you said like the 2.5 2 PN terms might be the reason why, you know, you're kind of overestimating or underestimating the eccentricity. But if anything, I, th I thought, uh, you know, 2.5 p.m. is dissipation, so we thought the eccentricity would go down. But you did you like have any idea or why they? Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, I kind of swept some things under the rug, um, right? So I think this this blue this green line is just having the one Postonian theory, just having the additional precession or advance, right? Yeah. In, in reality, you have like maybe like 1.5 Postonian. You, you can have like two. You can maybe have some cross terms, you know, it's a hard problem. So it could be any of this. It doesn't have to be 2.5. The code includes terms up to 2.5 because if you wanna think of dissipation, right? Mm -hmm. But I think in the code there, there is much more in just uh, this simple extra precession uh, term. Oh, okay. So we've tried to look on that, but we could not find that decent conclusion uh, at the moment. So it's, it's still open, I guess, finally. Right. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Oh, I see um, something on the chat, right? Yeah, so we have a question from Andrew, uh, Andrew Prentice, uh, a query about the discovery of the flattened shape of the large lobe of Arrakos. Um, also a query about the problem of ridding the initial orbital angular momentum of the Arrakos lobes prior to collision. Um, yeah, but what is the, the question exactly? Um, okay, so I guess the idea is that... Is it like why is it is it, why do we have the why is it flattened? Uh, yes, I've come online now. Um, 
I don't look to my background, just to the foreground. Um, it's not as neat. I'm like the New York man. Um, one of the fascinating discoveries of New Horizons was that although we first thought Arakoth was, a, we called it the snowman, a few months later, it turned into the gingerbread man. And that's always been a puzzle, why the larger lobe is flat. Um, the other query was concerning how you get rid of the, uh, and this has worried everyone, the enormous angular momentum and something like 100, if you start off just inside that hill radius, you have to give up almost two orders of uh, orbital angular momentum to bring a pair of bodies in a, in a circular orbit down, down to the uh, <clears throat> difference of the center of masses that there is there today. So that I know that the New Horizons people and many people have worried about that. And I just wondered what your thoughts were. I'll, I'll pipe down now. Right, so uh, for the flattening, actually, I have no idea. I think it's a question for a geophysicist. I mean, I'm 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 thinking of this as, as point masses or or ellipsoids. So I honestly don't know. But in any case, I mean, I, I was kind of mainly worried about the the obliquity and uh, and the slow spin rate. But at least for the angular momentum, just think of it. At least in 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 our model, it's it's like part of it's part of a triple. So mainly, it kind of means that I mean. So in this extent, um, you know, the orbit around the sun has infinite angular momentum compared to, to, to the, um, you know, to the, to the inner orbit, right? So we just exchange angular momentum between the inner orbit and the outer one, which is around the sun. So we just, we just dump everything to the sun, basically. That's what the of cosine mechanism does. Thanks. At least in this approximation. Sure. There's one point I do agree with you on, and that is the, the need for the high strength materials. My work has suggested that the, the densities of these uh, the two lobes are now about 1.7 times uh, grams per cc. And I've, I've mentioned that to McKinnon a few times. They have low density materials. So I'm comforted by the fact that in your, your paper, you've also concluded that you need high, high density materials. So that, uh, that's a plus side. Um, there yeah, was... I, think in, I think in the McKeon paper, they need low density because they, they want the spin to be close to critical. So if you have lower density, you can, you can, you can, you can kind of uh, increase your critical spin rate because it's easily breakable, right? But I, at least in our case, I just use one grams per, per cubic centimeter just as a proxy, but actually it doesn't really matter, right? Because, I mean, I have the conditions for a gentle collision on, on, any, on any input parameter I want. So yes. I don't need this constraint of, of a low density. It could, it could be even higher, I, honestly. That's good. Well, when the pandemic ends um, uh, I'm, and we do return to the campus, I'd very much like to meet you and uh, discuss your work. There is one point in common, which may be of general interest. I did publish a, na a paper in Nature exactly 50 years ago, uh, 50 years after your paper. And my acceptance time was about 28 days. I'm impressed that yours was nine. I, 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 extraordinary that you achieved that. Right. Why, why nine? No, I think it took me almost almost a year to get this published, uh, I think. It is, it, it's a different world from what it is today. Okay, I've enjoyed your talk anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rosemary, did you want to say something? I saw you briefly. I always want to say something. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think today I'll just make a comment. <laughs> really nice talk, really nice application of of our tricks of the trade, Evgeny, um, to some really nice, um, you know, unsolved problems. I really enjoyed your talk. Thanks. And thanks for throwing in getting the <laughs> not calling precision. I try, to, I try to do my best. Uh -huh. Yes, well done. <laughs> and I hope we can talk to each other in person very soon. Yeah, I hope so too. Lots yeah. of things to discuss. Yeah. Okay, um, we've reached the hour, but um, are there any other questions from the audience? Uh, if not, uh, let's thank Afghani again. His great talk. And for those of you who want to meet him, um, once we're back in the office, um, he'll be around on campus, I guess, like most of the week. And uh, he's in Office 101. So, uh, yeah, uh, 
please just chat to him if you want to. So yeah, thanks, thanks again for joining and uh, we'll see you uh, next time.